second lecture in the row of the lecture series Messes of Death. Arabesque is one of the most famous theorists of in the architectural field. And I was surprised when I uh, read that he was born in the United States. He was a, in Montana, I can't believe it, because I met him years ago, long time ago, in Los Angeles. He actually moved to Netherlands and uh, graduated there, but he is an educated architect, degreed at the University. And then and that doesn't read in the, in the biography. And then he worked at Frank Gehry's office, I heard. And he was working there, I think, two years. And then he left. And since then, he's taking revenge on architecture. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what he told me he will do today as well. He wrote uh, many books. And I would, like to, uh, I would like to mention three of them. Uh, what is modernism? When was it? To be published. What is modernism? Writing in this time, you are very uh, uh, encouraged guy. Then he did in, in 2000, he wrote in 2000, uh, a book called Architecture Must Burn. And this was the first time he stole a title from us. The second time? What was the first time? Oh, not from you, I stole from you. Yeah, also. So he is a guy who, uh, who is really talented to camouflage the ideas which are surrounding him. And uh, not so recently, in 1997, Queer Space. I think he will mention it all in his lecture, like he always is doing. Um, actually, he was, and then he uh, made the step to international importance. He was the director of the Architecture Institute in Rotterdam and made really fabulous and famous exhibition. Then he was the curator of architecture and design in this ugly museum in San Francisco the Museum of Modern Art built by Mario Botta. He survived it uh, very, very lightly, I can see, and became the artistic director of the International Architecture Biennale in Venice. It was uh, four years ago, in, or three years ago, in 2008. He is teaching, uh, he taught actually and is teaching um, every important school in the United States and also in Europe, namely in this school years ago. And now he is the director of the Cincinnati Art Museum. I would like to welcome you and I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say about the leaping whale kissing the sky. that he stretches the truth of God as much as he does in buildings. So uh, I would encourage you to take what he just said with more than one or two grains of salt. But I am very touched and flattered by the introduction. Uh, he's absolutely right uh, about one essential thing. What I have made a career of doing is looking at what other people are making or listening to what other people are saying, and then collaging that together into ideas or descriptions or stories about the human-made or the designed environment. And it's no accident that uh, I have a particular fondness for collage and assemblage, which might put me in the enemy camp. Uh, 
but it also is true that, as uh, Professor Pricks pointed out, I am a failed architect. I worked for Frank Gehry for two years. I then went to work for a very interesting firm in Los Angeles called Hodgetts and Fun, and then set up my own office. And as I'm sure has happened or will happen to some of you, all the early clients either got divorced or moved away from town. Not sure how much my designs had to do with that. And so I became someone who talked and lectured and wrote and organized, and that's how I've kept myself alive. So I'm not sure that what I'm going to talk about today is a revenge on architecture, as it is perhaps a justification for what it is that I do, which is to not make architecture, or at least to not make buildings. And I have consistently, uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, ever since I stole that title, made the argument that, in fact, we need to not be making buildings if we want to make great architecture. And so I'm going to continue that argument today, and I am going to prove to you why Coop Himmelblau is a great firm that should go back to making only burning flats, and how that idea and those forms have been picked up and are now found in all kinds of other areas. So, the leaping whale is how you always have to start a story. When Wolf Briggs first came to Los Angeles and started lecturing, there was the leaping whale uh, who, for him, represented the magic of this incredibly heavy object to levitate into the air, to withstand the laws of gravity, and to prove that it was in fact possible to move beyond the known into the unknown. And what I'm going to talk about a lot today, I think, is the way in which architecture and art tries to attain the unknown. You know, a few years ago, our not much lamented former Secretary of State, the war criminal Donald Rumsfeld, uh, became infamous not just for the crimes he committed, but for uh, making it clear that there were known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And this became a, um, a joke. But in fact, it's probably the only intelligent thing that he talked about. And it is, in fact, based on a great deal of theory out there, uh, which points out that there are some things that we know we don't know, some things that we just have to have faith in, if you are a believer, or that you just leave, as Kierkegaard word, would into the unknown, there are those things that you can assume as an absolute, as that which makes us feel small, but also makes us feel human. And then there are those things you don't know that you don't know. Those things that can erupt, that can happen, that can occur, and that somehow destabilize, question, transform, catalyze your life. The earthquake that just happened in Japan was in some ways a known unknown. You know that an earthquake will happen somewhere, sometime. But earthquakes are a perfect example of something that cannot be predicted. You do not know where it's going to happen. You do not know when it can destabilize your whole reality. So my criticism tonight is going to be that I am interested not so much in the known unknowns as I'm interested in the unknown unknowns. What I'm interested in not just is in not just how this whale can leap, but how it can kiss the sky, or as I believe an alternate translation of that particular line from Jimi Hendrix could be, can kiss that guy. Now this is a serious point of contention which I however will leave 
for another lecture. The real question is that this is the no. And what I would like to do today, first of all, is to tell you about what is going out on outside of the world of the Akhbibhata. This is a little utopia, a little asylum, if you would like, for the architectural crazies. A place where people are doing incredible things and where students are learning strange things. But this is not what is going out in the world. Um, of in the world. In the world, there is still everywhere the patient search for elemental form, the complete enslavement of forms seen in light. The rest of the world has as its center not the dark star of the Angevante, but the white star of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Now you might say, that's a very strange thing to choose as the real locus. But I would argue to you that there is no single other place in the world that sets more of the tone for the culture of art, architecture, and design than the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The Museum of Modern Art, in fact, has as its mission to not just tell you about modern art, but it says in their mission, we define modernism. That's quite a statement. It basically says, we know the correct way to translate modernity, the state in which we all live, into form, into image, into space, modernism, how we give shape to the modern world in which we live. And we know what that modernism is in painting, and we know what it is in design, we know what it is in architecture. And in architecture, it is our own building, which is a reductivist, bland, but perfectly well-composed temple to elitist and isolated forms of abstraction. Several years ago, they decided they needed to be even bigger. And so they hired a mediocre modernist architect, Tanaguchi, to design them a new temple. And Tanaguchi, who is not a dumb man, said to them, thank you very much. Now, if you give me enough money, I will make you a nice building. If you give me more money, I will make you a beautiful building. And if you give me enough money, I will make the building go away. So they gave Tanaguchi, reportedly, close to a billion dollars. And he made a building that almost goes away. Unfortunately, not in a Misean form way, but in a way that leaves the last vestiges of a kind of polite modernism hovering around these great masterworks that reside in this temple. I have a name for this kind of modernism. I call it W modernism. And I called it after the chain of hotels that is now spreading all over the world. They have a 40 plus in the United States and Europe and expanding all over Asia and the rest of the world. Now, hotels are a particular type and maybe they don't have that much influence, but they are symptomatic because hotels, especially of this sort, are the places where the effective elite everywhere around the world comes to stay when they are doing their business. This is where they go to meet each other. For years, including in Vienna, the Hilton Hotel, and Wolf might remember this from his childhood, was the place where the elite would gather, where it was at one time even chic to be seen. It was an emblem of being part of a modern, global, international culture. So it is with W. But W is for people like me, who don't want to stay in a half-baked tent to recall either a past modernism or Louis XIV, Louis XV, or Louis XVI, depending on which chain you stay in. We are middle-aged men of some means who want to stay in something that approaches modernism but doesn't hurt, is not too painful. 
And so whether we are in Dallas or in Miami, whether we are in San Francisco or wherever all these other hotels are, and I quite frankly don't even know where all three of these are, you could find something that is not a good building, but that looks like modernism, that has all the elements of modernism. And this is what people outside of the Angevante think is hip, especially when they walk in. The buildings are kind of bland and banal, but you know what? Most people don't care about buildings. A, that might be a shock to some of you, but most people don't notice the outsides of buildings. They walk by them and never crane up their necks. However, you walk in and you are surrounded. And W knows not just how to create a minimal modernism, but a theatrical version of that modernism. It stages the idea that we can all live in the lighting effects, in the formal compositions, in the sequences that 150 years of modernism have taught us. We can tempor temporarily reside in good design with everything from Danish chairs to fake fur throws to the kind of exposure of the body that is so much part of the metrosexual culture that now dominates that effective elite. There are local variations. This is the W in Mexico City where the bathroom in a true homage to body culture is exposed to the street and in fact stands between the bedroom and the street. The room is painted a hot red and you can lie in a hammock on the porch that is an extension of the bathroom. But those kinds of variations are minimal. This is what it means to be at home in modernism. The mothership, the W New York, originally designed by David Rockwell, which takes all of the lessons that we have learned about how to control technology and how to control it not just in terms of where you place it, but also to use it to activate and end scene, create a theatrical environment out of the world in which you live. So what I'm trying to say is that we now live in this global culture where everywhere all around us, architects, good, bad, and indifferent, are creating fragments of an international culture run by the effective elite. Because again, remember, architecture is, always has been, and always will be, the built affirmation of the social, political, and economic status quo. And when these buildings do become taller or larger, they reach for iconic stature and for big size and try to twist and turn themselves into some form of identity. But they are still just part of a forest of forms that looks the same from here to Bratislava, to Berlin, to Paris, to New York, to Los Angeles, and even in poor old Cincinnati, where I live. Now, good architects, young architects, architects who don't build very much, are obviously trying to push that particular language, are trying to think how we can reassemble those kinds of forms. They are trying to make forms that are so minimalist that they question the building itself. It is in fact possible to turn either a house or a parking garage into a piece of theater and to make people set up, sit up and notice that there is something here called architecture. It is, don't get me wrong, possible to still do some things that I would think of as pretty darn good building. And I give you here as an example the uh, China Academy of Art in Hangzhou, China by amateur architects, which has a wonderful way of using available technology existing vernacular prototypes, 
as well as standard lessons learned from the Corbusier and from all the other great masters of Western architecture, and builds much of it out of recycled and reused materials. It is possible to react by going back to the basics. And at the fringes of the world of architecture, we in fact do see a number of architects who are trying to push architecture beyond the built affirmation of the status quo, who are not making a double-style architecture, not even twisting it in any particular way. I'm sure you all know about World Studio, the studio founded by Sam Bachby that went into Hill County, one of the poorest counties in the United States, I think in fact officially the poorest county in the United States, and used recycled lumber, recycled tires, recycled car windows to create everything from homes to chapels to community centers for the very, very poor inhabitants of this area. The work has a rough appeal. It is lived in even before it is finished. It seems like a happenstance assembly that yet is carefully controlled by the, com the compositionary skills of the studio and its studio leaders. I believe that the fringes of architecture, there are people who are pushing and pulling, stretching and deforming forms, such as Shmilan Radosh here working in rural Chile. I also believe that modernism can be pushed to such an extent and then can be pushed even further through the photography of someone like Iwan Bam, that it proposes an alternative to the standard ways in which we inhabit our world. I also think that at the fringes of architecture, there is much to be done by not building, but by unbuilding. I'm sure you all know the story of Lincoln Center in New York, which started out as another billion dollar project which was going to design, be designed by big famous architects until the Lincoln Center found out they could no longer afford it and hired Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro to peel away, redo, re-inhabit, reinvigorate all of the parts of this giant cultural mecca, bit by bit, piece by piece, a process that is halfway along. And of course, that same firm, Dillis Cofidio Renfro, did what has become the most popular architecture in New York by far, the new park that was built on the High Line, the former trail, train line in Manhattan, cruising through buildings, allowing other buildings to rise up because of the reuse of this as public space, but more than anything else, making us aware in its design and through the views of it get, that it gives of the reality and the history of the place. What interests me is that these are architectures that look back and that look around, that gather together rather than trying to twist, twist particular types into something that we already know. There is experimentation going on. We hope that someday, even though he's not a particularly nice person, someone like François Roche will get a chance to build a building that does indeed collect dust and transform itself as such. We hope that the kind of students who show their work on Sucker Punch Daily and sites like that will get a chance to create their organic clouds hovering over parks and cities. I have a small prediction to make, one that maybe I hope does not predict the future of a Professor Pritz's chair, and that is that postmodernism is coming back. I would suggest that you all go out and get your old James Sterling, if anyone even remembers who that is, Michael Graves, and all the other people's books, because even the kind of people who are stretching uh, form through the use of computers are reverting towards the fascination with how we can use types and prototypes and how we can use the rendering process itself 
to build memory, place, recognition, stories, perhaps even jokes, into our built forms. Postmodernism will come back. It is even already showing up in some of the colors and in some of the forms of one of the other studio professors here in the Sakum Sakurum of the Angevante. I would say, and I argued this with Professor Lin, that there is quite a lot of postmodernism in his work. Not, of course, when it floats out into space. I wonder, in fact, what would happen if we realize that space will wind up looking not like this, but like the sets, but like the sets for Avatar or the Star Wars movies. But this, somehow, is what we dream of. If the whale could leap far enough, high enough, it would become a spaceship and float up into the blue of sky and create this kind of fantastic architecture. It would move out into the blue of sky. It would create forms that would push existing technology and existing forms into something that we do not know yet, but in which we have great faith. I could end the lecture there, and we could all go home happy, knowing that postmodernism is upon us, <laughs> knowing that most people don't care because they want to achieve a status where they can afford a night in a W hotel, and have a little bit of hope that students like yourselves will come up with things that are stranger than spaceships or leaping whales. However, I can't leave it there, because I do think that there is a serious issue. And that issue is that we have to figure out where we are. We have to figure where we are at. And in the simplest form, that means knowing where we are in an environment that can be anywhere. Most of us, at this point, live our social life and obtain our knowledge through the internet or through other digital platforms. Now, the strange thing about these digital platforms is that they're highly corrosive. And I found this out, and I was trying to get some images of it, but I failed for a very specific reason. When I asked my students, where I'm teaching now, to design a digital equivalent of the Cincinnati Art Museum, which is where I'm the director, having fled from architecture, having failed at too many of these lectures. I went into art, run an art museum, and then couldn't help myself, so I'm teaching architecture. So I said to the students, design a virtual version of the Cincinnati Art Museum. It can be internet-based, it can be an app, it can be a game, it can be a second life type of platform. What's most important to me is that there be a digital virtual equivalent to the art museum. We spent about a month on this and finally realized that it was a failure. And it was a failure because digital platforms, in the end, tend not just in a contingent basis, but absolutely towards speed, transparency, and indexality which is to say they seek to organize in as flexible and fluid and accessible a man manner as possible. They seek to make that organization visible, absolutely, and they seek to do it at a speed that is such that you can't even notice it. It's great, except that when you are an art museum, you are trying to build, you're built around this very strange conceit, which is that you have originals, great paintings, great sculptures, great sofas, that cannot be reproduced, that are material, and that you have to see to contemplate. That you have to get off your horse, stop for a moment, and concentrate, and look, and have an experience. And the whole building of an art museum is built on that experience. And I would argue for you that 
That is only an extreme version of the problem that architecture has. Namely, that it, if it focuses on making buildings, will be condemned to being useless as the kinds of speed, indexality, and transparency that are inherent on a society that is based more and more on this global network of available information as that progresses even further. There will be no need for buildings, I take that back, there will be a need for buildings as warehouses. Warehouses for people to work or sleep in, as warehouses for goods that get ordered through the internet, as warehouses for spectacles in which Justin Bieber can play in the giant dome that was intended to display art at one point. Hangers, flexible space, in which architecture is corroded out by financial considerations, by the necessity for the speed of getting your money in, building, getting your investment out as quickly as possible. As rules and regulations and standardization take over the world of architecture, we are nowhere. We are left without space. And making architecture digital will just speed the process up because all of the fanciful imagination will be leached out by speed, transparency, and indexality. And someday I will argue this with Patrick in person. <laughs> what I argue that we need are mandalas. A kind of at side that actually tells us where we are in the world, that helps us figure out where we are at in the world all around us. We had a great one two years ago in the United States. So I assume there's some Americans here, some people who might recognize this. This was the mandala that got us not just a new president, but what we thought was going to be a radically new political structure. Of course, as the Who said many, many years ago, in the end, here comes the new boss, just like the old boss. Won't get fooled again, except we will by the next such phenomenon. But this image was so powerful. It was the O of Obama. It was the rising sun that harked back to Ronald Reagan's promise that it's morning again in America. That was his symbol for political change in America. It was the American flag. It was the great road towards manifest destiny, the idea that in modernity, anything is possible if you just keep working and building towards some unknown, known unknown future. It was a great symbol of hope. It turns out, however, that that great road west has turned out into a road of flight into sprawl, into suburbia, and has run up against the wall of sprawl. Everywhere, all around the world now, cities are sprawling, are turning into a concatenation of human dwellings that reaches from here to Timbuktu, in Europe as well as in America. No place is spared. The central city is left only as a kind of museum piece, as it is here in Vienna, where the big corporations, the fancy lawyers, and the politicians have their seats while the work goes on in back offices elsewhere, where the culture palaces define images together with the advertising agencies, and where the police and the judges keep it all together. Life happens beyond the ring. Life happens out there. Life is directed by signs, signs that tell us where to go and what to buy, signs that tower over our landscape as the Marlboro Man once towered over the landscape of Los Angeles as the buildings clung rather desperately to the hillside behind him as he marched off to his, rode off to his manifest destiny, which of course was death by cancer. What controls sprawl is not necessarily those police and judges who sit downtown, but the invisible, embedded systems of control 
security that is everywhere. What disappears in sprawl is visible form, as these artists predicted almost a hundred years ago, looking at the first gas stations in which the buildings disappeared into no more than smudges on the paper, in the same way that a human being disappears in this self-portrait into no more than a smudge dimly seen reflected in a dark glass as a telephone, a mechanical device, stands in for the human being. We may all, in fact, be becoming nothing but the same, replicants living in a world of sprawl. Because, in fact, sprawl is only a symptom. It is, for architecture, the most important symptom because it is the physical one. But it is a symptom that, as Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels had promised in 1848, all that is solid will melt into air. Unfortunately, true modernity does not occur. Or if it does, it occurs in a way that they might not have recognized. The family falls apart. The corporation falls apart to more and more recombining business units. The state falls apart, as we are seeing all over the world, either grouping itself into loose confederations like a Schengen, or falling apart into smaller regions. Everything around us sprawls. Even our bodies sprawl and fall apart, infected by technologies from drugs to glasses to artificial limbs and implants <coughs> that keep us alive, and of course sprawling beyond the girth that we should have. Now you can believe that all of that is because there is a malevolent plot somewhere, that all those zeros and ones are creating this illusionary reality. Or you can try to design for this kind of world, creating form out of those zeros and ones. And someone like Honey Rashid and Lisa Couture, especially in their experimental work, where they see technology as a way of gathering together what is unseen but available, and through a particular process of giving it form and making that form unstable and undulating, allowing it to remain just long enough. I would argue that there is a tradition that will help us build for this world of sprawl. It is a tradition in architecture that goes back to the late 1960s and early 1970s that tried to unearth those aspects of modernism as well as those aspects of modernity that we once hoped would create a truly democratic, open, and perhaps even spiritual environment and see if they could not be recombined, got reused, rethought, and made into a form of architecture. What was essential about the kind of architecture that started coming out of New York at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, London at the Architectural Association, and in strange outposts like Vienna, was not that, was that this was not an architecture of utopia that proposed perfect environments, static environments, but rather that it was a messy affair. It was what I call experimental architecture. It was architecture that tried to tell stories, that believed, as Bernard Chumi said about the Manhattan transcripts, that you might even have to commit a murder to create great architecture. It was an architecture that tried to not make stable form, but unmake such stable form as it found. An architecture of digging, of mapping, of unearthing, of contradicting, of refusing to accept reality, but also refusing to propose an alternative, realizing, however unconsciously, that you cannot propose set form. You cannot create something that remains static in our sprawling reality. You have to think of architecture instead 
as a continual unfolding of the world around us into a never-ending and never-beginning landscape and a mirroring of that same reality all around us. Architecture must be the gathering together of the fragments that already exist to stand witness and to give memory to a world that wants us not to know. Architecture is a reenactment, a theatrical attempt to restage the world in such a manner that we can all be actors in the world that we would like to make our stage. We must stand witness, John Haydick said, to the very destruction of humanity. That should be the task of the architect, and not just of the architect. It was somewhat earlier than that, because of course art is always earlier than architecture, that artists such as Robert Rauschenberg began worrying about how we could take the elements of everyday life and use them as anchors, as bits of memory, as he did when he took the bed that Jasper Johns and he shared and turned it to an artwork that now hangs in that museum of modern art. Art as an assemblage of bits and pieces of reformed material. And if I could give you a tip, I would urge you all to go see the little Lichtenstein show that is at the Albertina right now. It was a real eye-opener for me, and I was quickly trying to see if I could get some images in my hotel room, but failed. But as an aside, you will, if you go to that exhibition, see how a great artist can take the pieces that you don't notice, the fragments of everyday life, and turn them into monuments, into things that remain. And that tradition still continues on today in generation after generation of young architects. It is a tradition that looks at unbuilding, at opening up, at moving through the buildings of Vienna and Bratislava that imagines, as Levius Woods put it, an anarchitecture, an architecture that refuses order, that refuses structure, that might already exist somewhere in underground Berlin and might someday come shooting out, destroying the world around us like a leaping whale, that might turn out, turn into an unfolding or into a disturbance of weather that vibrates as you move through it. It is in that tradition that I first got to know and love the work of Karl Himmelblau, a tradition of open architecture, of the open heart, the open eye, and the open mind. The open eye, seeing where you are, looking at your environment all around you, refusing to accept what you've been told and instead having your eyes wide open. The open heart, an architecture that is open to humanity and open to things that cannot be articulated by logic. And the open mind, an architecture of leaping whales. It's an architecture, ooh, oh my god, something strange happened here. I'm sorry, this did not show up on my Computer. There is a true instability in this architecture. Um, <laughs> it is propagating itself into fragments. Maybe I'll, <coughs> I'll figure out how to do that. Uh, um, an architecture that breeds like insects and takes over the state buildings within the Erste in Vienna. An architecture that is a sketch that comes straight out of the heart or straight out of the mind with eyes closed, the psychogram. I think still one of the greatest inventions of late 20th century architecture, one that I've tried to teach my students, but I guess you have to have a particular kind of Viennese alcohol to be able to treat it. Really. <laughs> it was an architecture that proposed that we could create open, contingent, rambling structures that I felt and feel could in fact start to pick apart a world and create something profoundly unstable, something existing on long, thin legs, something always leaning, 
something always moving beyond what we thought we knew. At times, perhaps, like the leaping whale, not quite leaping yet. At times, like a star that has come crashed down to ground, or, as it's supposed to be in the case of the slide on the bottom, like a guitar riff playing against the noise of the city trying to be heard. At its best, of a fantastical complexity and of a daring cantilever that always refuses to accept gravity, accept what engineers or financers tell you you really can do. And in fact, it's a great tribute to Corp Himmelblau that so much of these leaping whales were built and now have started to pull apart the sensible and staid world of even somewhat neo-fascist cities like Munich. Even in my own little Ohio, in the dying town of Akron, there is a giant sailing roof that leaps above the ruins of what used to be the tire capital of the world. And if the galleries are not skylit boxes, it is the curators who are to blame and not the architects. It is, however, always difficult to let the whale leap, to be able to truly kiss the sky when the budget is holding you down to earth, when codes are holding you down to earth, when you can't even see this building. These are horrible photographs because when I went to the school, I was escorted out under armed guard as I was trying to take photographs. This is an architecture that remains reserved. I have great hope that these structures will continue to leap and will continue to undulate away from what we know. But I am also worried because now Kolb Himmelblau has become the establishment. Kolb Himmelblau has become a large firm that does important buildings for the effective elite. And can they twist and turn their way out of the constraints that this particular place puts them into? Hans Hacke put it, I think, best when he adorned the fragment of the building that was to be torn down to make place for the atrocity that is now Potsdamer Platz with a work of art that said merely Kunst bleibt Kunst. Art remains art. Does architecture remain architecture? Can buildings still be architecture? I hope they can, but I think that there is a danger that architecture will always somehow, when it turns into buildings, become appropriated and perhaps even misused. So I am still interested in experimental architecture. I don't care how big Kohlpinnenblau is. I don't care how many big buildings they are making. What I care about is that they can still make brains. Brains that feel the pulse of your blood inside of you. That they can still create cities that are maps of the world. And I would say that I hope that Kolb Himmelblau, especially now that Professor Pricks has been liberated from the care and feeding of so many needy students, will be able to pick up again on this experimental tradition. One which I think is very much alive in the world of art. In a world where memories and stories and fragments come together in an uncomfortable reminder of the world around us. Where a photograph can show you a found X that marks the spot, that anchors you in this hot red theatrical world. This is a corner in Los Angeles that is about a block away from where I lived when I was teaching at the Andermante for a few months. This was what I came home to. A Chevron station 
a supermarket, stores, this group together. But here somehow, in this composition, and also on an unnaturally clear day in Los Angeles, pulled together into an assemblage that is indexical, that is transparent, that is fast and about speed, and yet that remains, and yet that has all the weight of knowledge, of presence, that clarifies a world of sprawl. Artists are great at telling strange stories that cannot be known, explosions of milk cartons that occur in the middle of a banal building and draw your attention until your gaze shifts, the eye always looking, always open, finding perhaps the deep recesses of the almost David Lynchian space off on the right side of the picture. I'm interested in photographs that might be portraits of particular people living and working on the street, but that once you get by those faces and those figures, give you those signs, that empty space, that road, now filled with all the grandeur with which painters once depicted dukes and duchesses standing, sitting in their estates. Artists can use technology to bring even that banal temple of modernism <coughs> to life with stories taken out of context and projected on the building. They can take those places where most of us are at home when we are on the road, the American Hotel, and infect and inflect them with birds, with animals, with strange occurrences. They can document the banality of our environment, a banality that becomes even more harrowing when you realize that each one of these photographs show a place where a murder has taken place. Photography today, at its best, gives us that Miesian by Nahenis in a way that architecture cannot, because it is an almost nothing in which what remains has such weight, such permanence, such clarity, that it cannot be denied. Even just by naming the streets of Los Angeles and superimposing them on a mountain, as Ed Boucher did, or by giving us the fullness of all those goods that our sprawling environment creates, assembling the emblems, the logos of the Fortune 500 companies onto a single gold cross called Bling Bling. I have a particular affinity for a kind of art, of which there is a fair amount going on today, that takes the bits and pieces of the world around us and assembles them into whirling dervishes, into whirlpools, or into tornadoes that might take us into some land of Oz that assemble bits and fragments of church and buses and buildings into structures cantilevered beyond what we know, that are maps of the world created by someone like Mark Bradford, who takes handbills he finds all over Los Angeles and then glues them together, paints over them, scrapes away, paints over, scrapes away, until he creates what he calls a map of Los Angeles. Julie Meritu, who creates maps of a whole universe, a kind of unstable mandala, the kind of mandala that recognizes the instability of sprawl, or in Matthew J. Jackson's case, that is a memorial to the fire bombings of the Second World War, the charred remains of a map or of a countryside. Artists right now are trying to figure out where we are and how can we reassemble that world. Digging a hole down to China, or in this case, down a kilometer into the earth, so you can hear the noises it makes. Reflecting the world all around us in an unstable manner. Liquid sky coming down to kiss us, rather than us having to move up to kiss it. 
There is a tradition in art and in architecture that sees itself not as the making of buildings, but as the destabilizing of all of our relations, as the making us aware of all of the systems of control, as the ritualization of everyday places so that a work of art can be a well-cooked time meal by Rick Richard Architecture can be no more and no less than painting a disused railroad between 27 villages in Sicily, piling up some rocks that mark a place, or putting in a stair that lets you move up to the sky. It can be the reuse and reorganization of Europe's greatest steel mill into a public park that allows for places of assignation, places of play, places merely of knowing where you are and where you've come from. It can be as simple as proposing that all we need to do to radically alter our historic cities is not to blow them up or put skyscrapers in them or find some way of stopping sprawl and bringing all of it back into the core, but just changing the filters at the ends of the locks, whether in Amsterdam here or you could do it in Vienna, so that the canals become swimming pools. There is a kind of territory between art, architecture, and performance that is undecidable. And in that undecidable characteristic, as in Damien Hirst's pharmacy, lets us question how we are inhabiting our world. That says that maybe all we need to do is just to leave well enough alone, to merely make us see what we already have, rather than to build more. What remains is the ghost, insistent, and seen perhaps out of the corner of your eye of the world around us, a reminder to look around you. What remains is a hole in reality, a blowing up that cuts through in the tradition of Mother Clark, the world as we know it today. What remains is a kind of fog, a cloud, something that cannot be known, that hovers on the edge of what is constructed. I think that Frank Gehry, of all people, had a good name for it. He called it a fish. The fish, when he started building them, or making them, was, on the one hand, a commercial project, a lamp. On the other hand, it was a very personal memory from his childhood, when his grandmother would get a carp once a week and put it in the bathtub where he would play with it until it was taken away and turned into gefilte fish for the Sabbath meal. But that's a cute story and one that reminds us how important memory is. But the fish, more than that, is also, as Frank Gehry points out, slippery and smelly. It is something that is not a building, something that, in fact, inspires building, something that reaches for perfection but is not a circle or even an oval, but something that is more difficult to catch, a kind of built psychogram. So when I directed the Venice Architecture Biennale, a little more than two years ago now, I asked a whole number of architects what I thought was a very simple question. Namely, how can architecture reveal, appropriate, and domesticate those systems, which are mainly of the technological order, that define the world that we live in, that world of sprawl, and how can it do so in such a way that we can be at home in that world of sprawl? And Ante Lu created an armada of air conditioning and air purifying units, pointing out that, as Rem Kohlhaas has said, all conditioned space is conditional, and ultimately what we do is create a conditioned space. Across from that, uh, Studio Asymptote created these hybrids between vehicles, bodies, and buildings that altered in appearance as the light changed continually around and above them. And Frank Gehry even made what I thought was this very moving piece, 
harking back to the days when he said that a building under construction is much more beautiful than when it is finished. When it is finished, it becomes something that is past, that stands in the way of development, that almost always has to be changed, that hides, that tries to resist, that tries to be monumental. Under construction, it is still the possibility of continual transformation. It is still the art of making, the art of constructing. Bauquist, the utopia within our city. Vicente Gugliart and his students at the IAC created an example of Web 2.0, embedded technology everywhere, form becoming completely trans, uh, transparent, life becoming a continual party, and everything addressable all around you. That could be a kind of utopia or dystopia, <coughs> as Matthew Ritchie proposed in this morning line, a fractal geometry that could move from the size of your hand to a whole universe. Or it could be the building blocks for a future building or city that is made up out of children's toys that are cut apart by laser technology and reassembled using the algorithms the computer develops in Greg Lynn's Golden Lion Learning Installation. In the end, uh, several critics pointed out that despite my attempt to honor the experimental tradition, there was something utopian about this whole exercise. So in fact, we went back to Eden and built a garden. And Catherine Gustafson reclaimed a bit of the, of the arsenala to have a working version of the ecotopia we should all be looking forward to, as well as what I think is one of the most beautiful attempts to create an emblem, an at sign, a place where you can be in these gently curving, interlocking uh, circles made out of grass that were then surmounted by these helium-filled clouds that she said were an attempt to visualize trailing clouds that flew behind Mary and the other saints as they moved up to heaven on the great frescoes of Venice and obviously, I think, were a very light version of a leaping whale. Every, elsewhere in the Biennale, we collected that work which we thought was experimental, using found materials to create a new kind of and very usable space, reusing everything from hybrid interchanges to uh, washing machines, proposing that some of the bits and pieces through which our sprawling global financial conglomerates work can be reused to create disaster relief, proposing in that tradition that we can eat away at the monuments that we have inherited, proposing that in fact we can bring joy, circumstance, maybe a kind of new Babylon back into the heart of our state cities, and of course all focusing on the necessity of creating an architecture that builds with the land and that gives back to the land rather than using up natural resources. A new kind of utopianism did creep in, one that dreamed of an organic future without cell phones. <laughs> an organic future that, in which there could even be building blocks that would take over little bits of your city bit by bit, like this very inventive use of the quarters that you put into a parking meter to create a small pot. But in the end, of course, it all looked a little bit like Avatar and Hollywood always does it better. Architecture can only create these kind of theme park visions of what a future might be like if we can move beyond militarism. To me, the best structure, the one I thought should have gotten the Golden Lion, was one that I fought very hard for. This was the pavilion created by the, uh, Lith the Latvians. Uh, sorry, yeah, Estonian. Yeah, Estonian, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there must be Estonians here. <laughs> that was bad. 
<laughs> my sincere apology to all citizens of Estonia, uh, and maybe also to those of Latvia. But uh, uh, this was a recreation of the gas pipeline that is being built between Russia and Germany, created here between the Russian and the German civilian. A snub both <coughs> at the political power of those countries and at the state forms, the monumental shapes in which they present themselves, and also making visible a little <coughs> fragment of all of those technological system, systems that do allow us to live in sprawl. And it just happened to be an absolutely beautiful space as well. What did won the golden, uh, golden Lion, however, was what turned out to be a very prophetic work by the Poles, who proposed, even right before the crash of the fall of 08, that all of these glittering masses, these fragments that are used by that global effective elite, are going to come crashing down and will have to be reused as farms, slaughterhouse, or any other use we might be able to think of. I went, I went forward <coughs> after that crash to create another exhibition at the EVO in Valencia. And I, seeing how late it is, won't spend too much time, but just point out that I tried to assemble those people who were trying to find ways in which we could make technology tangible and experiential, who were, in fact, assembling the bits and pieces of our sprawling world, as Elliot Hanley did here, into works of art that could allow us to know where we are today. And you might even recognize some of these pieces that propose a melting of the forms that we think are so fixed all around us. These were experiments in architecture and in art that propose that, in fact, architecture can be a continual act of figuring out re-indexing, reassembling, rethinking, remaking the world around us. It can be the messy task of reassembling our reality into a whirling new landscape that will unfold continually as sprawl does, but in a manner that will allow us to connect rather than separate us, that will even things out rather than creating hierarchies and that will create a unity between form, image, and space that will be a true form of modernism unfolding out of our landscape. And so we had a whole series of experiments that proposed a new way of figuring out where we are, where we've been, and where we might be going. Maps of possible universes places where we could go. And then I went back to the Venice Biennale last year when Sejima took it over and made an architecture that in many ways took, our, took the uh, discipline back to building, but also moved it even further beyond buildings as I had promised. She actually managed to get someone to create the cloud about Philippe Brun, which, of which Philippe Brun was only dreaming. She used artists with much more force than I have to show that they can create sensible space, experimental environments, truly <coughs> leaping form with much greater success than most architects can. At that Venice Biennale, we saw the building blocks of what might also be a future world sprawling beyond the scale of the body, the scale of the city, becoming a continual landscape that moves and grows. But what moved me most in all of that Biennale was this installation by a Belgian group called Plot. Sorry, called Rotor. What, what's happening to me now? Uh, called Rotor, um, who took materials that had been made by humans that, present, that uh, brought to mind the great enthusiasm we once had 
about being able to use chemical technology to create a truly modernist world, a world in which every surface would be made by humans, in which there would be no mark of our particular lives, but we would all dissolve into this perfect world created through science and technology. What were made in the end? So, uh, of course, what remained was the marks of actual use that in, imprinted itself on all of these human, uh, human made materials. The marks of people walking, the implements they placed on them, the shadows of what was part of these structures. And what I learned from this very simple installation in which bits of buildings were reused and looked like the most abstract of modern art was that, in fact, it should be possible to create something that is not the blue of sky, but that is the brown of earth, that is as open, as optimistic, as beautiful, as a whale leaping to the sky and kissing a guy, but also as real, as contingent, as fragmentary, as messy, and as humble as the stuff, the basic things, the reality that we all live with every day. I hope that architecture will continue to experiment and that in some day we might have a true architecture of the open eye, the open heart, and the open mind. I'm not sure if it will look like the buildings that Professor Pricks has built or will build, but I am sure that here at the Angewandte there are today many people who will build that kind of architecture, and I wish you all much luck with that. Thank you.